Oi! Oi! Hey! Oi! Looks like you're working on a new idea. Who are you and how did you know that? I'm your inner voice, dumbass. Weird. So what are you working on? Uh, it's a new idea for the homepage, but shouldn't you already know that? I'm not as into you as you might think. Anyway, what's the big new idea? We're gonna do a brand refresh. A brand refresh. <laughs> Sorry, I get a bit nauseous when I hear that term. No, this is gonna be different. We're gonna have a big slide, promo slider, uh, an animated explainer video, some parallax, and some background videos. Ten design trends guaranteed to triple your conversion rates. I hope you're at least going to test it. Meaning? Meaning that you'll run an A-B test. But if you do that, what happens if it loses? If it doesn't win, we don't use it. And we go back to the old idea. But I really believe in this idea. I'm sure you do. Just like the last 15 ideas you slapped on the website. So, back to my question. Are you actually going to test it this time? Yes, we're going to test it. And if it loses, it gets rolled back? Well, no. I really want this on the homepage. Don't be such a f***ing hippo. We spent a lot of time and money on this. So run a test. We are running a test. And what's the outcome so far in the test? It's not doing very well. It's like losing by 10%, give or take. So it doesn't work. We need to find a way to make it work. Or you could just trust the data and give up. I'm not talking about this anymore. You proved it doesn't work all by yourself. But I want it to work. The data in the test says it doesn't. Fuck data. I suppose that means you're going to do it anyway. You just met this guy, FD Chambers. He is the owner of a boutique marketing agency. It's small, developer, designer, copywriter, and him. He does all the marketing. He's a little bit, you know, behind the times. Ah, but recently, he had a traumatic episode. Something really bad happened. It wasn't his pet goldfish that died. That's, that's not what happened. But this goldfish is very dead. The reason the goldfish is dead is that I'm sick and tired of listening to marketers say, oh, web visitors have an attention span less than a goldfish. It doesn't matter. It's not about the length of the attention span. It's about how our lack of attention changes the way we use technology. The way browsers change, it changes how we operate. This is how people sometimes find you these days. They'll search for something webinar software, get some ads, then they'll get their finger, put it on the command or control key, Mac or PC, and then they'll just click them all, opening them in tabs. Now they go into a comparison shopping mode. They might not even look at all the ads. First one, that's relevant, okay. And now it comes down to this attention thing where they're not gonna spend very long. Next tab, don't get it, closed. And closing a tab is different from the back button. The back button, you're just kind of going back there. When you close it, you're deleting it. You're undoing the existence of this thing from your, your kind of experience. You're like, no, I don't like it. Okay, it's very different. It's immediacy, like can you kind of capture them in those first few seconds? So, simplest way to figure out if you have like a clarity problem that people can't figure out quickly is to run a five second test. Hopefully you all know what these are. So show someone a screenshot five seconds, take it down, Ask them a question. You can also use your laptop or a piece of paper. So I asked 25 people for these results, what product does this company sell? Okay, we start with this one. Reef Fishinars. Some call them webinars, we call them Fishinars. Don't do that, you're done. Okay, next one. Go to webinar. Security and reliability. I don't know why you're saying that to me. I asked for webinar software. But 44% of people got it right. I'm like, ah, come on, this page is so bad. It's probably because the logo has webinar in it, right? It's, it's letting people know this is what it is. I think it's a bad page, so I just blur that out, do it again, 12%. I'm right, I feel good, they're done. Okay, the next one is us, more specifically, the client of FD Chambers. What makes us a trustworthy partner? I really don't care. I wanted webinar software, 8%. Okay, and Chambers himself, did this ad and sent it here. One little mistake, because he sent it to the homepage, because he's old school. If he'd gone here, this is just a product page, 
That's exactly, it's not a dedicated landing page, which would be even better, take the nav off and all that kind of constructive stuff. Just put it here, 54. But that's not what he did, because he's an idiot. So they're done too. Now the person doing these searches was that client. They're just checking in on what the marketing is. And they're like, holy crap, that's not a good experience. Then they went to this one. Okay, uh, trial present plus. Kind of meaningless, but the subhead. Powerful webinars made easy. That's kind of clear. 44% got it right. But like I said, <clears throat> it's in the subhead. Just flip it. Run it again, 68%. Bring that clarity out. So this company, this client, they're like, wow, oh, that's way better than ours. So they look in the footer, figure out who built this, another agency, contact them. And this agency says, yeah, we do CRO. We can double your conversion rates. So they're like, that sounds awesome. So they go back and they fire Chambers, and they go with this new one. That's the traumatic moment that happened to him. But he's a pretty confident guy. So how do we get around this? We just put CRO in our logo. That's easy. That's what we do, right? It's not difficult. But we need a case study, because we've never done it before. We'll do it on our own homepage. That'll be the first thing. And that's what you heard him uh, in our dialogue. It lost by 10%. Now, the designer was really pissed off about this, because he did the classic, can you just whip something together? I want all this stuff on here. Can you just whip up a design? Because designers love to hear that. And, and it lost. So the designer's like, OK. We're gonna, we need to do this properly, so I've got a little thing for you. I found this simulator that I want you to take part in. Okay, so this is, he has to compete with the CRO bot, which is a predictive conversion algorithm that we're writing at Unbounce. The way it works, he sits down, he sees a landing page. He has to figure out if it's good or bad based on his extensive experience. And then we'll see what the predictive algorithm thinks, and it, like good for a green stripe, bad for red, and then we'll see the truth. How did it perform? What was the conversion rate? And then compared to tens of thousands of similar pages, is it good or bad? This is how it went down. This doesn't even have a headline on it. This is not gonna work. Yeah, <laughs> see, the robot has got this completely wrong. No way. Yeah, who's the man? I'm the man. Too many colors. <laughs> off. I don't get it. it. This is not the way it's supposed to work. It's got orange. Orange is good for conversions. F***ing bullshit. I've been telling clients for years, use orange, you will convert. How can this be a top performer? Look how ugly it is. Ha! 404 page with a form. Newsletter sign up. What? <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, we know what to do with our 404 pages now. So I got two out of ten? F*** off. Okay, so he was shamed by this experience. And he's like, okay, we'll do this right. Okay, he takes it out of the logo. I'm not gonna do any of that yet. We're gonna learn how to do this properly. Now, this has been said a lot today, and Pep, I know, is a big, you know, a big fan of taking the R out. We've heard a, the same thing keeps coming up. I think we should also take the C off. I think we're just optimizers, that's all we do. We make shit better. That's just, we don't need the rest of it. And we should thank someone for this entire concept way back. So this guy, he's the guy that invented optimization. He's like, he's the original optimizer. It's, this is not a design accident, this directional cue. Right? He knew what he was doing way ahead of all of us. Anyway, so he needs to learn how to do this right. So searches for what's a good conversion rate? Because a lot of people don't know that. Right? Like, are we good or are we bad? And he finds this. Okay, so this is a, a report we released last week. It's based on machine learning and 75 million interactions with 64,000 lead gen landing pages. Lead gen's important, so they've all got forms. At the start of it, it's got this. This is 10 different industry verticals, like health, travel, real estate, legal, and their conversion rates. So this is kind of the median. These white bits through here, and then that's the top performer. So he just takes his client list and he maps it on here. Number one, oh, it's 32% below average. Number two, 54% below. This is not good. Look at this guy, 60, 172% above average. That's awesome. Except that that was the one that left. 
Christ is not so awesome. But he said the other people will double the conversion rate. Well, according to the data, that would be 32%, which is way above from this sample what anyone's getting. So he's like, okay, I'm going to call them on their BS, and we're going to win this client back, but we're going to do it properly. So he has a new mission for the company. We're going to become a data-driven agency. That begins with setting up some core values, what we believe in, so that we can do this right. And having core values of the company can be really successful. We have it at Unbounce. Moz has tag fee, but for lots of good companies have them that can help guide your decision making, and hiring, and all this kind of thing. So for a data-driven company, curious, start wondering about things. Uh, if you're not interested in the pain of your customers, even though it hurts to see it, then you're not doing it right. Evidence-based, obviously, we observe things. We make changes based on the observations. This is covered a little bit um, by Bill, designing for ideal. When you figure out your ideal customers, there are experiences you can design to get more of them and less of the others. For a SaaS product, sometimes just taking off your lowest pricing tier is a great way of doing that. Life cycle focused, not just getting customers, but taking them. We have four squads for life cycles at Ambience, and we mark it differently based on what stage in the customer journey. And transformative, the best way of getting to Get someone to understand why you're awesome is to show the transformative impact of using your product or service. Okay. They need this because the way that marketing is done right now in Teams is completely broken. I've seen this in so many companies. The relationship between marketer, writer, designer is completely flawed. <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of research for this, in-person interviews and surveys. This is some of the, the data I've collected from that. 81% of designers <clears throat> have to start their design work before they get the copy. And they hate that, right? Because it's going to take a week to get the first draft of the copy, and they're making some weird templatey thing based on the competitor or best practices or whatever, but it's not really based on anything important. 62% receive no customer data at the beginning. So they're kind of flying blind. They have, they're making a template, and they don't have any data. 53% said they get feedback from non-designers. It gets worse. 98% of marketers say they're responsible for giving this feedback. It's just worse than the designers think. They don't even know that these people don't know anything about design. And 87% of them think they're qualified to give this feedback. Bullshit. Total bullshit. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I'm on both sides. And I know that is just not true. There's overconfidence on both sides. I know how to design for conversion. No, you don't. I know how to critique that. No, you don't. Okay, so we need to find a new way to help people work better together. Oh, and 5% of designers, only five, said when their work is critiqued, it's based on data and performance. It's all subjectivity. It's a strained relationship. We could use the data in that report to change this process entirely. First step, eating chips. Bear with me. So, as Michael said, four weeks of 16-hour days trying to get this presentation ready, and I'm pretty exhausted. So I live in Vancouver with my fiance Nicole, and I'm up at 3 a.m. working on this, and I get the munchies, so I go and get a bag of chips. And she's trying to fall asleep in the next room, and every time I, I do this, it's so noisy, and I'm like, I'm feeling guilty. I'm like, how can I solve this problem? So I go into the bathroom, Get some scissors, cut it like that. Completely silent every time I want a chip. And I'm like, yeah, I just optimized the shit out of those chips. <laughs> and that's how we have to look at it. We have to look at everything we see around us and MacGyver things, because that's how to become a true optimizer, because there's a lot of sucky stuff in the world that's not that hard to fix. Okay, so that's just thinking in a different way. Here's the new process. Okay, three parts, discovery, design, and delivery. It's a very big thing, so I'm gonna focus mainly on the design part, and a little bit of the others. So, discovery, this is what you do at the start of the project. Uh, the research is the collection of data, internal and external. Internal might be, 
past performance of campaigns, it could be customer interviews, or whatever you have internally and external is from trusted sources, landing pages and overlays, unbounce, PPC, WordStream, Search, Moz, Wistia for video. There's lots of data sources that are credible, and you combine them together. This lets you figure out conversion opportunities, and then you can prioritize them. I love the fact that there have been so many discussions about prioritization today. It's great, because I have a new one, just because you need another one, right? But this one's, actually, I'll get to that. So in the research, what is in this report? The conversion rates by industry vertical you saw, reading ease, how easy it is to read your text, word count, emotion, and sentiment. There are eight emotions in there. Okay, so uh, I sent a survey out before, and some people answered it and submit their landing pages, which is very brave. Whose landing page is this? Here, there, okay, thank you. So I'm not gonna be mean. I'm usually mean with these things, but I'm not going to be. Uh, let's look at the data. So this is in health. Do you know your conversion rate of this page? Yeah. And Okay, okay, we won't do that then. Uh, I forgot to ask in the survey, I did later on. If you're above 9.3, you're beating 90% of the competition. That's interesting to know. Uh, here, word count and reading ease. So word count, as you see, as the number of words goes up, the conversion rate's going down. That's pretty, like you wanna put it around four, less than 400, this has got almost 1,400 words on it. Okay, so that's a bit of a problem there. The reading ease doesn't really change much. So this is, as it goes up, this is getting simpler. So like graduate down to sixth grade. Right? It's not really changing much, but it's a bit better there at the sixth grade level. And there's a numerical value as well. You wanna get around 80, it's at 72. It's easy to figure these things out. Um, and I'll show you how in a second. So I created this, which is a Google Sheet where you put in the details, I'll let it play. You put in uh, your name of your page, you put in uh, which industry it's in, you put your conversion rate, and then the reading ease and word count, which you can get from somewhere like readable.io. You paste it in, and it'll tell you those things. And then it will basically compare it, use this benchmark data, and tell you where you are. It'll grade your page, but it'll also prioritize. If you click, it's actually a photo of me, but that little button there, it will prioritize them based on the likely levels of ROI, because if you have a really good page, chances are you can't really make it much better. But if you have a bad one, and the deltas of word count and reading ease are the further they are away, the more simple opportunity you have to make an improvement. So it's a great way of prioritizing based entirely on data. Okay, so now you have some priorities. You go into the design phase. This is a constant conversation uh, are you an artist or are you a designer? What's the difference? Well, this is probably the best definition. Art is like masturbation. It's selfish and introverted and done for you and you alone. Design is like sex. There's someone else involved. Their needs are just as important as your own. And if everything goes right, both parties are happy in the end. And that's what it means to design. It's more about the experience. Speaking of experience, this is not just visual design. I'll just put an X on there. So this includes copywriting, psychology, Visual design and interaction design. Four corners of conversion all lumped together. I spoke with a copywriter at Unbounce that hadn't seen the report, and I said, if you knew these five data points about your industry, your page, how would that change your work? He says, it would take 35% less time. Now, he made that number up, but that's what his perception was, like a third less time. So it's, it's, it can be really impactful. Let's talk about the copywriter. Because she's also frustrated because she writes this stuff and then gets the design, it's full of Lorem Ipsum, and she tries to plug it in and like, the headline doesn't fit the design. Well, change the headline. Well, no, because that's the message, but it doesn't fit. Well, constant discourse. The broken, the dead fish. Uh, this is about clarity, you know, like we said at the beginning. Fuck off doesn't mean go away. Fuck off means fuck off. That's how clear we have to be. Now, I'm not saying you should talk to your customers like that, but that's the level of clarity we need in our messages. So reading ease, how easy it is to read. I touched on it briefly. 
So it's the flesh reading ease. If you go to readable.io to put your own text in, that's flesh Kincaid, slightly different, but it's the closest thing to this. You can see here, this is for credit and lending. As soon as you get to seventh grade, look at that, the change in conversion rate. Just having that little insight alone is incredible. You can put your copy in there and go, just change it, change it, change it, see if you can change this reading ease, shorter sentences, simpler words, less jargon. Uh, that's readable.io, you can do it there. It'll let you do it free a couple times, and then you have to pay, but it's like three bucks a month, and it's really useful. How many words should you have on your page? Well, look at this one. As you add all these words, look at the conversion rate change. This is business consulting. Every 250 words you add is dropping conversions by about 20%. Now, these are aggregate numbers over, like, pages are compared with thousands and thousands of similar pages. Um, there's a very good chance these are going to be able to help you. We are working on doing absolutely personalized ones, like just for your page, which will make it even more accurate, but this, this stuff can really make a difference. Uh, here, credit lending word count, look at that again. It's terrible. The, the, the damage you might be doing by just talking forever about this credit card offer. Sentiment. Okay, there are only three, positive, neutral, and negative. Vocational and job training. Boom, the more positivity you put in there, it kills conversions. That's, you know, this is the percentage of the words that are positive. As soon as it gets down here, it's, you know, that, that level of positivity, you'd think it would be good, but it's not. How do you fix it? Well, you don't make it more negative. They're different graphs, right? Different scales. You need less words, fewer words that are positive, not more than a negative, because they both have a different chart, and they're both independent. Uh, emotion. What can we do with emotion? <sighs> I get emotional about taxis in Vancouver. They're so annoying. We don't have Uber or Lyft or anything like that because some weird government shit. But they're really frustrating. And I got this app uh, for blacktop and checker cabs. And this is the first screen. That's the first thing when I, when I open it. There's no guarantee that a booking made from this application will be processed by the system or allocated to a taxi. Why do I have it then? The system cannot be depended on for the delivery of a taxi. And you accept full responsibility for the risk and consequences. Like, this is really not very nice. And then I'm like, oh, OK. Next screen, eight error messages, and I haven't even done anything. This is just obnoxious. But there's no Uber or Lyft, so I fill it in. Anyway, the trust is not there with this company. I don't trust that they're going to be able to give me a cab. It's a terrible experience. This is for business services. You've got to have a lot of trust words. As soon as you get here, there seems to be a change over like 7%. You can look at a lexicon, and you can find words that fit into these different emotional brackets and add more or take some away. Okay, that's the copywriter. And this is all about words. We're going to move on to design and traffic in the next phase of this uh, research. But the designer can do an awful lot with that word data. It can inform a lot of design. And I like to think about design in terms of what I call semantic design. So are you designing something for the purpose of the, the subject matter, the content inside this experience. Uh, you think of Fordant's design principle. It's how the way something looks informs how it can be used. A round handle, you turn. A flat one, you push down. Semantic design is that on like a macro scale. Here's an example. If you eat tacos, you know that you need, or you order them in a restaurant, you get them in like one of these things, like the, the metal thing where you can put several in there. Okay, Check this out. That's brilliant. You don't need that anymore. It just sits by itself. That's semantic design. That's designed for the context of use. That's the kind of direction we need to go and think about as designers. OK, you have a blank canvas, your designer. What do you do? What do you have to consider? There are three kind of things that can be informed by data. Style, typography and color palette. Attributes, such as the page width and length. And then the elements on the page, your testimonial, your nav, your CTA, your form, these things. These are the things that designers thinking about, and they can all be informed by data. Here's like a, a design guide. You, you get the slides afterwards, so you don't need to worry about the details here. But what it is, these are all the elements I'm talking about. And these are three aspects of design. There's message, mood, and method. So message is kind of how it looks visually, and how you read the message and how it looks. Mood is how it feels. And method is the more technical interaction design stuff. 
And basically, in here are the different types of data that can inform design decisions about this. And this is the core value stuff at the end, which can also inform some of these. Here's an example that I'm not going to go through. Use it as a template or something when you see the slides. But this is, if we're working on a testimonial, what does the designer, the writer, and marketer, what can they use from that data thing to inform design? There's a lot of ideas in here about how it can actually be used. I just kind of want to put that in there. It's a lot of detail. Look at it afterwards for whatever thing you need to work on. So a designer, one of the high level things, color palette, what should I choose? You might be, you know, brand colors, but sometimes there's extra stuff you can do. Uh, here, travel, anger is not a good thing because we don't want to be angry on vacation. So you could take a color wheel like this, find some anger and rage, and just tone it down a little bit. And this is the way this information could change how a designer thinks. Typography choices. This is higher education. You need more joy. So you want to go in this kind of direction, not that way. Again, it's just knowing about this data will change how they do their work. And they can do that ahead of time, not while you know, they're waiting on this copy. They don't need that in this period of time because they have so much thinking going on based on this available data. Uh, how does it read? There's how it reads, like the words, but then how does it look? How do the words look on the page? This is the typographic golden ratio. The top one, that's terrible. It's all squished and it's so long, you're like, no, 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 no. And this is like almost every testimonial on a, on a landing page. Like it goes all the way over and maybe there's a slider, there's like five of them. This is easy to read. And the difference is this golden ratio. You can put in just your font size here and maybe if you're a designer, well, I'm doing like an Apple layout, right? I'm doing this, 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 so I only have this. So you put in your width and it will calculate the line height for you. And it will also give you all of the other, like for every piece of copy on your page, it'll tell you all of this stuff. This, again, informs everything you're doing on your page. Uh, maybe it's a complex thing you're selling and it needs to be complicated language and it's kind of professional. You might not want to go for illustration. You might want to choose photography to get that mood across. And then visual ID. This is some data you can collect quite easily. If you take your main hero image, something a designer cares about, and you look at it in isolation, what does it tell you about the product or service that you have if you just look at it on its own? I saw this landing page, and I was like, why is Larry King on here? And more importantly, why is he shooting laser beams out of his thumb? I thought, well, maybe some other people are confused by his presence. So I did a five-second test again. I said, what product do you think this company sells? Only 6% said business loans. It's not car loans. It's not student loans. It's business loans. Specificity is important. People couldn't figure that out. I'm like, well, maybe we've got a Larry problem here. So I blur everything else out, and I run it again. These are the responses. Meeting a guy, talk show. Something about old men, doctor consultation, Viagra, and a lot of people just didn't know. We definitely have a Larry problem. So I just deleted him entirely, and I ran it again. That's what they do, business loans. Look at that change, 36%. That's a 500% increase. This is just qual counted qualitative information. But what a change just by taking him out. And he's probably a very highly priced endorsement but give them another job. Move further down the page or something. Not helping there. This is the way designers want to work. Painting by data, not painting by numbers. So just a different way of working. And that's what this kind of information can do. OK, so you've gone through like the first round, written some copy. The designer's been working based on this data. They've got you know, this data driven, data-informed mood board, instead of like, oh, here are three options. Which one would you like? Which one? And then it's subjective. Well, I kind of like that one. This time, it's informed by data. So you're starting from a much, much stronger position. I'm known a little bit as a 11th hour man at Unbounce. Um, like, right at the end of a project, I go, what the? That's terrible. Why, why, why did you do that? And it's not always my fault, because I, 
nobody in, brought me in at the beginning at the right time, and then they asked my opinion at the end. And I'm really brutally honest. I might not say anything if you don't ask, but if you ask my opinion, then you're gonna get it. And that upsets people, and I look like an asshole. So this kind of thing will remove those types of problems because it's, it's you can say, but look, look at, we, I made all these decisions based on this data, and I'm like, oh, okay, then that's pretty cool. Okay, I'll stop, you know, giving my subjective critique. The, the designer might also say, the data says only 150 words on this landing page. Does that mean I can make it short? Or do I have to still put all these features in and maybe just like a few words per it? It's a very good question. We don't know that yet. That's coming in the next phase, but it's a great question. But I did a little bit of preliminary research on this. It's a small sample size, so it's just a signal, and I think there's something there, and we're gonna research it, but I took the four channels that word count is most impactful for. And I looked through some of them. I looked at the highest performing pages, average, and then the worst. And I looked at the average page length of them. Highest, average, and lower. Longer the page, the worse the performance. It is a small sample size, but it's a pretty interesting signal. And designers would love to know this because they can start with the right size and, and just go from there. It's not just like, oh, how many, how many things should we put on this page? And it was the same for travel. So I'm gonna dig deeper into that and figure it out. At the beginning I said client three was 16.33%. This is delivery. Now we communicate all of this data-driven work to the client. Uh, this. 3D presentation. So whose landing page is this one? All right. So 16.3%. Okay, so let's go, and um, this is delivered using the core values. So this is our company presenting to you, client, and this is how we make our decisions, this data-driven framework. So we wondered if it was a good conversion rate. 87th percentile. You're kicking ass with this page. Right? You can retain clients with that information. They're like, this is not good enough. Well, actually it is. It's really good. We, had, we leaked this to a couple of our power customers. One runs an agency. He said the day after, he'd already retained a client because they were complaining, and he went, look, we're really good at this. And they just shut up. Reading ease. The target is like 75 plus. You're at 48. 61 without the footer. So you know, like, work on that. You've got quite a lot of room to improve the simplicity of the language. Here, word count, three to 400 is the peak. You're at 502. Again, without the footer, you're right in the sweet spot, probably why you're doing really well, because you're close on both. For the footer, will it impact it? Don't know. You might want to just hide that, but make it available, you know, click to expand that information so it's not actually, it's available but not present. Curious also about this, the hero shot. Is it helping? So I ran the visual ID experiment. These are the four things that landing page is about, the four target customers you have. None of them, apart from a little bit of dog training. I mean, it's got dogs and leashes in there, so that's still really bad. It's not actually helping. I've got some ideas how to improve that. Empathy, caring about how they feel. What's it like when they read this? Because positive sentiment, we saw this. It's you don't want it. I put it in readable.io, it's slightly positive. Just tone it down a bit. Take some of the positivity out of that. Make it more neutral in my help. Evidence-based. Now, I see that you had a live chat thing up there. And I'm thinking, okay, and I'm making this part up. But I'm going to say it's really high performance for you having that. But it's not 24-7. Maybe you can't afford it. Maybe you're manning it yourself. Because I tried it at 2 a.m. last night, and there was nobody there. Kind of like... What was the guy in your example who, George, or whatever? So I thought, hmm, this is an opportunity to test a conversational chat-like form. Because live chat works, let's try making the form like that. So this is a landing page that we made. And we used this script. It's really new. Someone put it on GitHub about two months ago. It will transform your regular form into a conversational form like this, kind of like chat. And it's great because you just stay in one place, there's no clicking around, and you answer the questions. I mean, that's pretty cool. And it fits in potentially with, you know, what else is working well. Here's the code, really simple. You put in the ID, 
of, this is an inside unbalance, but like, just that, the idea of your form in CSS, and it will do that for you. However, problem with design trends, interaction design trends, they come along every year, they make a parallax and all, right? And they cause problems because they're not validated. So I ran an experiment with this. I put some user recordings on this to see how people were interacting with this because it is really new and really different. And this is the recording I got five minutes after I started it. Got some of it right, but then did something wrong. Clicked in the wrong place, and then got these error messages, and couldn't get rid of them, and it's just absolute craziness. And then refresh the page, did it again, same result. Just absolute mayhem. I'm like, oh no, I'm just ruined it. These people are gonna be so pissed off with me. And, uh, and then my genius fiance, Nicole, goes, but you got the email. Why don't you just contact him? So I emailed him five minutes after he had this experience. Apologies for the poor experience of that form. I explained, I've been experimenting with this. It was buggy as hell, I saw the bugs, I've fixed them now, but here's the content you were trying to access. I'm really sorry about the bad experience. Two minutes later, he replies, I've been a consultant for 25 years, and that's the best example of taking responsibility for an error that resulted in a bad customer experience. Much more likely to continue to engage with the Unbent's brand as a result of this. So, trying these things, being curious, trying these things that might be relevant, but you have to watch them because they might break it. I fixed it now, the bugs, and it's really smooth. Still seeing problems because it doesn't look like a form. So when you're like, well, what do I do, what do I do? You can't see, it takes people a while to find it, and there's no traditional CTA. So we need to work on the design of it, but it might be a good interactive device for a certain segment of people. Here's some early bullshit data from it. Uh, <laughs> this isn't even a test. We're going to test this, but this is just, um, I just need the user recordings. I didn't care about this. Uh, we will, I'll be working with the CRO and Speedos to do an actual test shortly when we get back to Vancouver. If you remember from this list of names, uh, the CRO and Speedos, this is how he got that name. <laughs> Look at those ties. <laughs> we did the ice bucket challenge a couple of years ago. Design for ideal. I noticed on the form, at least 18 years of age and a spouse of an active duty military service member. That's very specific for the ideal customer here. I went to Facebook, 18 plus military spouses, it's right in there, right? Just do a Facebook campaign targeting those people. I don't know if, uh, if you're doing something. I searched for military spouses and there was one question specifically from someone saying, I want to target da 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 da. I was like, how can there be this? It's so random. But anyway, that's really easy. Uh, life cycle, okay, so you have these four different types of customer in this thing, you have to self-select. Run four campaigns, four separate landing pages. Much simpler, much cleaner data, and you can fix the visual ID problem, because each one just needs to say, you know, look like what it actually is. Finally, there's no testimonial. That's pretty bad. Uh, so go back to the thing I shared about how to construct a good one. I reverse engineered a whole bunch of really great testimonials to come up with this script. If you ask your customers these questions, the stuff you'll get back is perfect for fitting into that kind of framework and that really high performance testimonial. And you'll get tons of amazing information as well just by asking those questions. And because the transformative aspect, you need the before and after really works. So the cat groomer thing. So here was a before shot and uh, after. Okay, so you add those. It's great. Nicole's obsessed with these sphinx cats. I think they're terrible. Okay, and then and use this, plug it into here, it's really simple, and based on all of this data, it will help you prioritize things that might actually have a higher chance of ROI. And they got the client back because the report was amazing. Thank you very much. Slides and the report you can get there.